some time to get in here and sit down and settle. But this is going to be Dr. Jeremy Hoff. He will be presenting this. Uh, he was born in Chicago, grew up in Evanston, Illinois. He holds an undergraduate degree in chemistry from Rutgers University in New Jersey, where he was a scholarship men's volleyball player. And he opened the pain management clinic at the Hampton Roads Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Center in July 2012, board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, and board certified in interventional pain management. Okay, now for the osteopathic philosophy, osteopathy is a philosophy that emphasizes the interrelationship between the structure and function of the body, as well as the body's innate ability to heal itself. So if you all could please welcome Dr. Jeremy Hall. <laughs> Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm not much of a podium speaker, so if I move around and you guys can't hear me, please tell me, okay? Just raise your hand or, or yell or something like that. Um, we're gonna be talking about uh, something very important to me uh, today and something, thank you, uh, something I'm, I'm uh, very passionate about as well. Um, something that we do research uh, on at, at uh, HRSM. Uh, unfortunately, many many of you may know uh, the doctors uh, at HRSM. It's never good to know a surgeon, but sometimes it's pretty important to know one. Uh, and, and some of these names have been in this community for years and years and years. I uh, promise you there will not be too many plugs about uh, HRSM during this talk. Uh, but this group has been around, I believe, about 56 years at this point. Uh, it's the oldest uh, group, oldest orthopedic group on the peninsula. Uh, and I'm very, very lucky to work with some fantastic doctors there uh, who have uh, really helped me to, uh, to build and grow uh, the practice that I, that I have now with uh, uh, rehabilitation and pain management. Um, and allowed me to start doing some research into stem cell therapies, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm an osteopathic physician, which is a DO, not an MD. Uh, so essentially we... Uh, go to medical school, uh, have the same curriculum a, as a, an MD has, and then we also learn a lot about the structure and function of the body uh, in terms of what we can do to it and how we can manipulate it. And so we do a lot of hands-on manipulations um, and, and learn different techniques to try and help the body heal itself uh, as opposed to just uh, pills, shots, uh, surgeries, things like that. Uh, which, which oftentimes don't necessarily work in line with what the body was trying to accomplish. Uh, and so that background has really brought me to what we're trying to accomplish uh, now, uh, which is moving as much as we can the, the mountain of, of, of societal medicine towards things that are going to help the body to heal itself as opposed to working against it. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the medications that we use, a lot of the injections or surgeries that we perform, alter the body's normal functions uh, and not always in a way that will um, progress it towards healing itself, uh, oftentimes just to cover up a symptom uh, as opposed to trying to correct the underlying problem. So I don't think you can see this laser pointer, so uh, I, I won't bother with that. But uh, essentially, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is uh, arthritis and degeneration. <coughs> Unfortunately, all of us have it, myself included, just about anybody over 20, 25 years old. You can take a picture of a, of a joint uh, and, and find some amount of arthritis there, uh, whether it's overuse, injury, or just wear and tear. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, tissue regeneration and how all of this stuff started. Uh, Nearly, nearly 100 years ago at this point, uh, somebody much smarter than myself came up with the idea that we should be uh, trying to help the body heal through its natural pathways as opposed to uh, uh, inhibiting that normal process. We'll talk about platelet-rich plasma or PRP injections, adipose stem cell injections, which are fat stem cells. You know, most of us, myself included in this room, can spare a little of, of, of that uh, if we can use it to help the body heal. Um, and then management of, of arthritis and pain. Uh, and then briefly, because it's uh, used to be the most common, but it, but it is somewhat uh, more difficult and a little bit uh, more uncomfortable, we'll talk about bone marrow uh, stem cell harvesting as well. 
Um, so again, we all we all have arthritis in here. Uh, <laughs> so we can all, we can all raise our hand. We all have some amount of pain in here uh, day to day. Um, there, there's there's not a person out there who doesn't. Uh, most of us just ignore it uh, until it gets so extreme we have to go see a doctor. Uh, but it is the most common reason to visit a doctor is for pain. Uh, and that's actually what drew me to this, to this uh, field is because I was hoping I could help the uh, largest group of pe people possible. Uh, so it's a very, very interesting specialty in that I can see just about uh, every single person uh, at some point in their life who, who's walking on any given street. Um, most of primary care visits actually involve uh, pain complaints as opposed to, I'm coming in to make sure my blood pressure is appropriate. That's not often what you go and you know, tell your doctor. Um, and unfortunately, we are not like a fine wine. Uh, we don't get better with age uh, necessarily. So, Currently, uh, elderly is classified at this point as above 65, and my mother would be very upset to hear that, but uh, the fastest growing segment of the world's population. Um, th these statistics are now a few years old, uh, but a, a, there are uh, 38.9 million people 65 and older in 2008, 12.8% uh, of the total population. Um, and then of that, then there's uh, 5.7 million are 85 years and older. Uh, and this number is growing uh, quite fast, actually, as, as our baby boomer generation gets, gets into this. Um, so, I mean, who cares about all this, you know? Why, I mean, why am I here giving this talk? Well, obviously you guys care about it and I care about it. Um, but the consequences of somebody having a pain complaint that goes untreated are really dramatic and they get worse and worse and worse the longer we wait to treat something. Uh, and we're not just talking about, well, I can't run a marathon anymore. We're talking about daily activities, dressing and bathing and feeding yourself, taking care of loved ones, walking the dog. This might, you, you might not think this has a huge impact on the people around you, but it really does. And in fact, Medicare is one of the highest expenditures of our entire uh, uh, government budget. Uh, so caring for this is, is really, really complex, and it, it, and it puts a strain on the economy, it puts a strain on individuals as to what they can do for themselves and what they can't. Um, this was, gosh, this, this slide is, is more than 10 years old at this point uh, because they don't include the, the baby boomers in this one. Um, women live longer and, and are smarter than men, but <laughs> so you can see they complain more too because of that. And so, and so the, these are the percentage of adults who have been diagnosed with arthritis uh, at, in terms of age, uh, and obviously that curve goes up. And so this, again, this slide is more, this is 2003 data, is more than a hundred billion dollars in the United States was spent on arthritis-related complaints, okay? More than 1% of our entire GDP, right? So uh, all of us would want to be doing all these things, but in reality, many of us are, are significantly debilitated, uh, take a lot of medications, have a very poor quality of life versus what everyone promised us in, a, in our golden years. Uh, and, and it can be very frustrating to people. Um, there are a number of different types of treatments, and I will try and get through some of this stuff fairly quickly uh, so that you guys have time for questions, okay? A uh, number of different types of treatments. Uh, conservative treatments are always where someone should start. The first option should never, be, uh, never involve a scalpel. Um, and, and hopefully not even involve something like needles or, or uh, something else, but physical therapy, massage therapy, acupuncture, chiropractic management, exercise, diet, uh, these are all things that we preach extensively uh, in my clinic. Most folks who are in my clinic, if they are not currently on a uh, arthritis diet or an anti-inflammatory diet, I've at least spoken to them about it every single visit, trying to encourage them to get on one. Um, we often will, I, we have a chiropractor in our clinic. I'm an osteopathic physician, so I also do manipulations. I think working with the body structure without uh, violating it is a very good idea, unless you don't have any other options. 
Uh, and then, of course, there's medications, which are now uh, one of the uh, highest costs of any medical plan is medication related. And we'll have a slide on that later. But even over the counter medications, uh, NSAIDs, anti inflammatories, ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Celebrex, uh, then there's narcotics, muscle relaxers, neuropathic, anti antidepressants, um, benzodiazepines like Valiums and Xanax, all types of different medications. Uh, and then we get on to the more aggressive things, the in interventional solutions, injections, and surgeries. So what's the problem with all of these? Well, they all cost time and money. Uh, and, and most of the time, people get to where they are either because they didn't have the time to fix it earlier or they didn't have the money to fix it earlier. And so now that it gets to a breaking point and they don't have an, another option. Uh, other than the conserv conservative treatments, uh, which is where we should all be starting, all of the other treatments are working against the normal body process. Our body heals through inflammation. There's a very complex inflammatory cascade that our body uses, and that's what we see when we cut our, our skin, and then we get a scab later on, and then it turns into a scar, and then the scar reworks itself into close to normal skin. That's all done through inflammation. And what we have done in this country is, is gotten you know, probably about 40% of our population addicted to anti-inflammatories, addicted to ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve. Uh, my father, uh, be, being a, a, a military vet, when he went to the VA hospital, they were more than happy to send him 1,000 pills a month of Motrin, which was really amazing. He would just line them up on his, on his uh, dresser, you know, and every once in a while I'd come in and throw them all away, and then they'd send him some more. Uh, so it, it's, we, we have a terrible addiction to this, and it's because it briefly calms down the inflammation we're experiencing from arthritis. Unfortunately, it also calms down all of the healing processes that might be going on in your body that are mediated through, through inflammation. Um, surgeries, you know, whether, whether you believe in, in God, creation, evolution, whatever else, there is no reason to think that our human skills can create something better than either God or evolution did. And so I am, I am, thank you. I, I am um, surgery should always be a last option. Everything else has failed. Because uh, there's no re and I and I performed surgeries previously. I'm not one of those guys we listed earlier who, granted, are amazing at what they do, uh, but they're doing something that is outside of the body. They're taking stitches, screws, hardware, whatever it might be, and implanting it into your body. And there is now a foreign object in your body that was not there originally. And innately to me, that goes against what we should be trying to do. Unless there's no other options, or you're dying or something, please, please don't don't refuse surgery if that's the case. So, so what we're going to talk about more today is tissue regeneration. Okay, so so this idea started years and years and years ago. If if you believe some of the stuff we hear in medical school about uh, uh, our Hippocratic oath and where that derived from, uh, he was apparently a big proponent of this. Uh, of trying to force the body to heal itself uh, and did some very interesting things um, it, to that and such as sticking a hot poker in somebody's shoulder to cause inflammation there, uh, which actually apparently worked. I think he died later on of complications, but, but the, the pain was better, though. The pain was better. Uh, so in the 1920s and 30s, we had the Hackett Hemwall Foundation, two of the originators of prolotherapy or proliferant therapy, and they found that if you injected dextrose, as anyone who, uh, who may have diabetes or a friend with diabetes, diabetes uh, is elevated blood sugars, uh, dextrose is sugar water, diabetes causes massive amounts of inflammation throughout the body. Well, if you use it in a controlled fashion, you can then control where the inflammation goes. And so injecting dextrose or sugar water into a ligament, tendon, joint can cause inflammation only where you want it to be and then force your body to reevaluate that and heal the area that you have uh, essentially damaged in a controlled fashion. Um, so currently, we have now graduated from just dextrose therapy into uh, platelet-rich plasma therapy, which is taking your own blood and spinning it down to get the healing and growth factors out of it, and then injecting that in a fashion that will irritate whatever structure you're trying to 
uh, heal, but also provide the medium that you would normally need anyways to heal something. Uh, and and uh, so that's prolotherapy here, uh, platelet-rich plasma, and then the stem cell injections. And uh, now there are other uh, types of procedures such as dry needling or tenotomies where you're essentially accomplishing the same thing but without actually any injection. Uh, and so that would be a uh, physical therapist, acupuncturist, or someone else taking a small needle and, and uh, beating up a tendon or a ligament until they cause some level of bleeding, and that blood then helps to heal. Uh, same uh, principles with a tenotomy or osteotomy. Uh, those are more surgical-related uh, procedures. So uh, essentially this goes in levels of um, strength. So prolotherapy would be the, the weakest response of all these although still very effective, uh, then platelet-rich plasma, and then stem cell injections. Uh, there, there are obviously other options, hundreds of other options. Um, in my opinion, most of these other options would either be more dangerous or less effective. Okay, So there's doing nothing, which no one here wants to do nothing and get worse. Uh, surgery, medications, um, these other options are going to be much more expensive in the long term, whether or not your upfront costs are more, but taking a medication every day for the rest of your life gets extremely expensive. The recovery time and the initial cost from any type of surgery, even if you are in Medicare, can be very expensive. You're missing time, missing time out of life, missing time from work, missing time with your family. Uh, and, you know, God forbid you have any, any type of complications where you may end up uh, not being able to come back home, but then having to go to a, a, a rehab facility or a nursing home after some type of surgery. Uh, and, and something I've said for many years at this point uh, that, that we discussed already, nothing humans can imagine or create will ever be as intricate, complex, balanced, or evolved as is the human body. Okay? So any of these other options that are working against what our body would normally try to be doing, yet we're, we're really rolling the dice. Uh, so very, very briefly, we're going to talk about medications because uh, I want to be able to get, wrap, wrap this up a little more. Uh, th this was one of my patients who came in a, a couple of years ago and was really struggling to figure out which Medicare drug plan he should, he should use. Uh, he was on seven medications at the time, Zocor, Zoloft, Metoprolol, a Butrans patch, and a testosterone supplement, and then Viagra, and he was very upset he only got 10 pills a month under his, <laughs> <laughs> under his drug plan. Uh, he was newly, he was newly retired, newly on Medicare, uh, didn't know which drug plan, so we actually sat down and went through some of these, and you can do this on Medicare.gov and see for yourself. The uh, standard Medicare drug cut drug coverage was going to cost $70 per month, which sounds really good. We looked up his specific medications from Glendale, Glendale Pharmacy in Newport News here. His medications would cost him $19,000 per year. He only had three brand name medications. $19,000 per year. $2,400 a month. That is a nice mortgage. Okay, And that's not going away. It's getting worse, especially with our drug plans now, because this was a couple of years ago. Uh, the cheapest plan available was thirteen thousand, and, and then obviously his drug coverage with, with, or drug plan was higher. And then now, now we move on to well, take over the counter medications; they're cheaper. Here is the the average number of deaths per year from anti-inflammatory toxicity. And again, the, these these statistics are from '99. This has gotten much worse. So NSAID tox toxicity in 1999 killed almost as many people as AIDS. Wow. Okay, that's NSAID overdose, anti ibuprofen, Motrin, leave. Okay, these are not. Even though you can buy them over the counter and you don't need a 21 year old ID or anything like that, these are not safe medications. Okay, these are things that are covering up something the body is trying to tell you. Uh, so uh, th this guy is fantastic. Um, but unfortunately, Oscar is not his real name. He's a very nice fellow. I still see him. Uh, he was uh, 20, no, 24 or 26 years military and could no longer run and had to get out. Uh, and he had fairly severe arthritis in his knee. Uh, couldn't handle injections. Any, any kind of needle just killed him. Uh, otherwise very strong. 
Uh, he had a partial knee replacement and three months out from surgery could not move hardly at all. Uh, he, he maybe had 35, 40 degrees range of motion, uh, couldn't get back to running, couldn't even walk the way he was, limped around in the office. Um, it was a, a year later, he still had significant pain, still had never regained the range of motion, and this was a partial knee replacement, something that's supposed to be in and out, you're back to running in a couple of months, uh, and, and before this, he was running five miles every single day. And granted, he came in because he had pain. You know, it wasn't, he wasn't, somebody didn't just put a partial knee replacement in there because they felt like it. You know, he, he had significant complaints in arthritis, um, but he has never gotten back to running. And we're, this, was, this was years ago now. I think, I'm, I think he, at this point he's two and a half years out from surgery. He still cannot run. He tries to. He tries to run, but he still cannot. And so was this something that was worth it? I, I can't answer that for him, uh, but, but I could tell you what his answer was. So let's look at complication rate, rates from total joint replacements. There are people who don't even make it out of the hospital. Uh, the complication rate during the hospital stay is about 6%. Uh, within 90 days is 7.5%. Overall, within the first year is as high as 13 to 16%, depending on what statistics you look at. Okay? And that, that's across the board. Now, is a 13% complication rate, which could be a severe complication like hardware failure or infection requiring removal of the hardware or a uh, deep vein thrombosis, a DVT, is that something that's worth it just to say, well, I hope at six months that I'll have better range of motion, less pain, and more movement? I can't answer that for you, but I can tell you I would certainly explore all of the other options prior to pursuing something like that. Okay? So not accepting that that's our only way to go, that's our only path, is very, very important and looking for other things that you can do on your own or that someone else can help you do is, is very important. Okay? <coughs> so, uh, anyone essentially would be a candidate for something like this. The only people that we have difficulties with the stem cell therapies on are people who have baseline bleeding disorders or who cannot come <laughs> off their blood thinners for some reason. Okay? Uh, otherwise, there are very few contraindications to this. And the reason is, is because we're taking your own stuff and putting it back into you, okay? There's nothing from a drug company, there's nothing from an outside source that we don't know about, okay? We're taking your blood and putting it back into you. We're taking your stem cells and putting them back into you, okay? And it's not, you know, this isn't something where we send it off to somebody to grow and add this and that to it or anything like that, okay? So why would we bother with this? Well, safety is a huge issue for me. I've just shown you some of the severity, some of the severe complications from anti-inflammatories, from surgeries. The costs of medications are astounding. Okay, less invasive, propor proportionately much more effective than other alternatives. I would say in the past year we've done. Uh, well, just just looking at knees only, I think we've performed forty six. Uh, I, I'm not including my partner because I know he's done a lot of these too. Uh, 46 stem cell injections on knees. Not a single person has gone on to have a knee replacement. Okay? Now, I, this is not five years out, but from the past year, this is what we're saying. Okay? Not a single person has gone on to have a knee replacement. I have a 93-year-old who has had this done. Okay? And then I had this young, I, I just did both hips on a... 42 or 44 year old. Um, so th there is no limit here. Uh, th this is used on college athletes. There is no age range where this is not acceptable. Okay? Um, these are performed if we're doing platelet rich plasma. And again, you have to decide on what we're doing based on what your symptoms uh, are, what the workup shows, the x rays, the MRI scan, the physical e evaluation, your clinical history, and all those types of things we would decide the severity of your problem and what the most appropriate avenue was. Um, but it may be the prolotherapy injections with the sugar water, it may be platelet-rich plasma, it may be stem cell injections or some type of combination thereof, okay? With the platelet-rich plasma, it takes about 15 minutes. We draw off some blood, we spin it down in a centrifuge, 
okay? And we put the concentrated platelets back into whatever target it is, whether it's the knee, the shoulder, a tendon, a ligament. Um, we will do it for the back in specific situations. Um, but essentially, anywhere that you can uh, identify where you can put pressure on something and it causes you pain can be injected, okay, with, with the platelet-rich plasma. The stem cell injections, whether it's uh, adipose or, or bone marrow, um, generally we reserve that. It's a very powerful uh, uh, therapy. We generally will reserve that for larger structures like joints. Um, we, I have used it before for rotator cuffs, uh, and, and it has seemed to be fairly effective with that. Uh, but usually you can use something less um, aggressive like the platelet-rich plasma uh, and still have pretty good outcomes. So we generally will reserve that for joints. Uh, I have done a few uh, bone marrow stem cell injections into the discs in the spine. Um, that is very, very experimental. Um, but, you know, both of those folks, uh, they both, one, one was 52 uh, and the other was in his 70s and they both give me hugs when they come to the office and, and say thank you so much. Yes, sir? Could you explain what you mean by the word aggression? <coughs> Um, kind of, you know, ch chasing, chasing a fly with a 45 instead of a fly swatter. Okay, so you might not need something aggressive. Okay, so, so if you can look at, at more targeted treatments, so if, if I have significant degeneration in my knee, but the real problem is that I have a, a ligament imbalance where my medial collateral ligament is too loose and my lateral collateral ligament's too, too tight and I have a small tear in the meniscus. I don't know that I need to have a knee replacement for that, even if the x-rays show that I am a candidate for a knee replacement. You know, because realistically a knee replacement wouldn't fix a, a tear in your medial collateral ligament. It doesn't even address it. So why not look at something less aggressive first such as even prolotherapy injections to the medial collateral ligament and see if we can tighten that up and have a good therapy program that's going to loosen the lateral collateral ligament and improve your flexibility and range of motion instead of going for something that is more aggressive and maybe not needed. And, al and also more expensive when we're looking at it that way. You know, again, again a lot of folks could save themselves a knee replacement by having some targeted therapies done ahead of time and rebalancing and getting stronger and getting more flexible and then they wouldn't have as much pain and therefore they would not need a knee replacement. Well the same thing goes for these types of injections. So th this also goes in order of aggressiveness. The platelet rich plasma is very simple. You draw blood and you spin it down. To get your fat stem cells or your bone marrow stem cells, I have to place a needle into your fat or a needle into your bone in order to get those. And so the, those are inherently more aggressive procedures because it's not just a little blood draw. It does require some harvesting of stem cells. So that's what I mean by aggressive. Uh, it, you know, again, that causes a large inflammatory response and a large amount of healing. And if we don't necessarily need that, if we can do with a smaller, more conservative, conservative treatment, uh, it, it can sometimes even work more effectively. Uh, yes. You. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask of, about this joint. How about SI joints? So, Does this work so on SI joints. Uh, also experimental, but it is a joint, and it follows the same properties as most joints do. Mm -hmm. So, it should be effective. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank yes, you. And, and and yes, we have done the SI joints as well. Okay. Thank yes, Becca. Is this commonly for joints, or I, I have a friend who's had multiple, multiple surgeries, had birth defects, tried to lengthen a leg, mm -hmm. and then. Yes, yes. And so in pain all the time. As far as the fat stem cell injections go, the literature is on joints. Okay? I will tell you I've injected it plenty of places that are not a joint. <laughs> uh, but the literature primarily support, supports its use on joints. The platelet-rich plasma and the prolotherapy, in fact, are only partially used on joints and are much more effective for the support structures surrounding a joint for breaking up scar tissue, for reworking our normal soft tissue and fascia so that it realigns itself in a more appropriate fashion. 
Yeah, so, yeah, he had all of these surgeries. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so that would be much more appropriate for something like the prolotherapy or the platelet-rich plasma, unless those did not work, and in which case you can always get more aggressive with things and, and, and try those. Hang on, guys. Maybe I'll answer some more of these. Okay? But I, again, I'm, I've only got about uh, 15 more minutes, so I'll try and go quickly. Okay, so at, as for the, the stem cell, the, the fat stem cells, uh, and then the bone marrow harvesting, uh, generally speaking, we take fat from the abdomen or from the love handles, spin it down in the centrifuge to concentrate the stem cells, mix it with your blood, and then inject it again. The bone marrow we do not have to mix. Uh, the bone marrow, typically, we will get it from your posterior superior iliac spine, which is uh, kind of near your sacrum back here. We will remove some of the bone marrow there and then inject it wherever we need to, whether it's in the spine or, or in the hip or knee or joint. Okay? Um, again, th this can be used essentially anywhere. The majority of the research and literature is in joints. Uh, the majority of the research on prolotherapy and platelet-rich plasma is in tendons and ligaments. So that, that would be another uh, opportunity. So drawing blood, this is our centrifuge here. We spin down uh, and then inject it wherever our, our associated target is. Uh, this would be harvesting <laughs> fat. Um, and, and fortunately, they've developed a much, much better cannula, so we don't have the, the, the shop vac hooked up to this really long <laughs> model. Um, when, I, when I first started doing this, this years ago at the VA hospital, that is actually what it was, this little vacuum hose, and I'm sure you've seen it on TV. It's very, very barbaric. It's much better now. Um, here's our harvest centrifuge that we use that spins these down for us to concentrate thing. Uh, and, and then essentially what we do is we take the mesenchymal stem cells, and, and please don't get hung up on these words, uh, the mesenchymal stem cells from the fat and inject it then, and that is what we are hoping will be encouraged to regenerate some of the meniscus, some of the cartilage, uh, whatever actually might be needed. Uh, and, and that's the idea behind these. Um, so this, this, this might actually be my fat. I'll show, I'll show you later. But that's essentially uh, pre-processing. Uh, this is nice, clean fat. That's why I'm hoping it's mine. This, uh, this is nice, clean fat here that we then would, would mix back and forth with the blood, uh, the, the lip rich plasma that we have, um, and, and then perform an injection such as this. So uh, this is me. That's my partner's hands, and this is me. I don't like doing stuff to... to folks in my clinic until I know what it's actually going to be like for, for the most part. Uh, and since this was a very new procedure, I'd done this at the VA hospital, uh, but unfortunately veterans often are uh, the ones that get experimented on. So I wanted to make sure the new technology was actually better than what we used before. So this is me. That's my love handle right there. It, I promise it was not the injection that hurt. I had a broken collarbone, and so it, it was, you know, that didn't heal. And that's what he was helping me with. Um, and so that, that was one of the places he injected about 11 places there because I had a number of different areas that, that needed help. Uh, and, I, and this was more than a year ago. I am tremendously better from this, and that's what made me start doing this in my clinic. Um, I had done it before for wound healing and some other, other purposes at the VA hospital, but we did not have anything in our clinic other than platelet-rich plasma. Uh, and, and the amount of, of improvement I had after this convinced me that we had to start offering this to folks in our clinic. Um, so this was also into the shoulder. I was an overhand athlete. Um, this was one of my first patients, uh, and you can see this is not a terrible procedure. She's laying there reading a book, okay? Um, and, and, you know, this, this was then her injection uh, that we did. Uh, this actually is a movie. So that's not going to work. So um, we'll move on. It, it was just a, you can see with the ultrasound here that I was using guidance, which guidance should be used for any type of injection um, unless otherwise specified. So with the ultrasound here, we were using guidance to identify her shoulder and her rotator cuff for this injection. Uh, sorry, that didn't work. Uh, and then the rest of this is research, okay? Uh, let me see here. Oh, uh, none of this stuff is important. It's just me talking, I do that a lot. Uh, more importantly, so 
what, what we've done with all this stuff is had enough time to figure out how to use this appropriately. Um, they, they, the concentrations of stem cells in your adipose tissue, we could not get them concentrated high enough until about two years ago with the technology that we had. So the technology I used at the VA, we had to use much higher volumes, which oftentimes was more irritating, and didn't necessarily stay where you wanted it to. So the technology has gotten quite a bit better, and that's one of the reasons we brought it to our clinic. Um, these are just a few highlights of, of articles, uh, and, and I have a whole bunch more in here. Um, highlights of articles that I use, that I read. I, I read about originally about 80 or so articles on this before we decided to include it, and I have very close to them, uh, about 120 total now. Uh, amniox, I will briefly mention, this is something new. Uh, cord membrane and placenta. I never like using something that is not from your own body, okay? I don't know whose cord membrane and placenta this is, but a company has uh, now synthesized this and found a process to do this. It shows fairly good promise. It is irradiated, meaning it has no, no uh, live cells from the, from the donor anymore. And it's supposed to decrease inflammation and mediate or modulate inf inflammation as opposed to all of the other treatments that, that I've been talking about that are actually supposed to increase inflammation and force a healing process in the body. So it may be something interesting, particularly in combination with some of these other therapies. So I certainly have not written this off yet. Uh, it does show some promise for joints and tendons. Um, and and as, as of right now, it's not covered by insurance, but it is not as expensive as some other treatments. Um, I don't use amniotic fluid. I've read the original research on this out of India where they took amniotic fluid from a pregnant mother during a C-section, walked it down the hall in the hospital, and put it in somebody's knee. That is not what we have in the United States. And I'm sure that would not be allowed in the United States. Okay, but that was the original research that did show promise for healing arthritis in the knee. What we have here is some freeze-dried, irradiated component of amniotic fluid uh, that has no viable stem cells of any type and no viable living cells of any type. So I do not use this. I don't think it's any better than the stuff that's on the market that is covered by insurance, and this, of course, is not covered by insurance. But there is some websites you can go to read about those things, and we are almost done. Uh, okay, I've read and reviewed multiple articles, more than 120 at this point, uh, within the past, all written within the past eight years prior to pursuing all of these things that we do. To me, it makes perfect sense to work with the body and not against it to achieve the desired outcome. Stem cell injections are a promising way to address issues of pain, tissue damage, and arthritis. And if it's good enough for me, which I've had it done, and for my family, uh, I would certainly offer it to anyone. So thank you very much. And I, I